Everybody that's in attendance, just so you know, we are recording this webinar. We will post the link to it on our YouTube channel and send an email to everyone. All right, hi again, everyone. This is Craig. We're going to get started here in just a moment. We'll have an introduction by Dee Prittis, who is at the University, no, Tennessee State University. Uh, is that right, Dee? Middle Tennessee State. Middle Tennessee, Tennessee State. State. Sorry about that. And uh, if you want to ask questions, there should be a little speech icon somewhere on your window. You click on that, and then you can write your questions. So I'm going to, I guess, mute my mic at this point and let Dee take over. All right. Again, my name is Dee Prittis, and I am a co-chair here with the National Communication Association Training and Development Division, along with Pui Sharon Kelly from University of Alabama Huntsville. So we like to refer to ourselves as, you know, the acronym, of course, NCA um, TND Division, to kind of to shorten all those syllables up. But today, what we're going to be listening to for our webinar will be a webinar called Training the Trainer, Career Pathways and Options in Workplace Organizational Communication. We have with us today Dr. Abby Rayner from Denver Civil Service Commission and Dr. Jeffrey Stafford from Eastern Washington University and Marshall Mike from Dean, er, Keene University. And they will be spending the next hour sharing with you their unique paths that they've taken on their, their journey. Um, so we are here with, as the TND division of NCA, we are offering this free webinar. It's the third one we're offering this semester or this fall um, for practitioners and academics that focus on training and development related topics. And we are here um, today. I encourage you just to sit back, sip your coffee, and allow Abby, Jeff, and Deneen the opportunity to share their unique journeys with you. Thank you. All right, everybody. So I am the first person up, and we will be covering four different parts of transitioning out of the academy today. Um, some of this you can also take to, if you want to stay in the academy, you can maybe use some parts of this to kind of figure out where you'd like to teach or you'd like to do research, things along those lines. But the first step of transitioning out is kind of like what I was sort of talking about before is identifying your transferable skills. And this is a pretty big buzzword in industry right now, but transferable skills really boil down to skills that you build throughout school, maybe extracurricular activities like writing in journals, being an editor, Maybe if you work on filming projects or something to that effect, um, you're building transferable skills in there that you can use in different jobs that may or may not have anything to do with that immediate project, but definitely will utilize those skills in some way. So maybe, for instance, if you are more of a statistician in grad school, or maybe you're more mixed methods or rhetoric, you know, whatever it is that your methodology background looks like, you can use those skills to market yourself in a way that corporations will really like. 
and they will be able to use your skills in ways that maybe you never even thought possible. So once you kind of figure out what transferable skills are for you, whether they're things like project management, maybe data analysis, public speaking, um, you can figure out kind of where you want to go with those skills if you still want to include them in your kind of career experience overall or if you don't. There's nothing wrong with figuring out if certain skills are ones that you like, things that come naturally to you that you feel like you're engaged at work whenever you're using them. Um, there's some skills that you will maybe kind of transition out of. Maybe you won't like those over time as much for whatever reason. Uh, for, for myself, it was that a lot of those transferable skills were more of data analysis, research, test development, kind of product testing, that kind of thing. Uh, although a lot of people think that I'm an extrovert when at conferences like NCA or um, anything along those lines, I'm actually not. I'm more of an introvert, and it's easier for me to maybe tutor one-on-one, -on -one, but teaching can be really hard energetically for me. So really thinking about kind of where I felt the most energetic, um, there's this one speaker who I've really admired a lot who kind of emphasizes kind of thinking about where your energy is, and that's kind of tied to your skills. So thinking about which aspects of your job energize you the most is really important. And if you want a longer list of all those different skills, the site ONET is really a great place to figure out what you like to do, maybe match those different skills to jobs. So if you, for instance, really like statistics, um, the ONET will kind of show you which jobs have anything to do with statistics. Same thing with the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. And there's some other ones in government and kind of private ones as well. And you can take a lot of tests to figure out what you're good at and what you're not. And then once you kind of figure out what your transferable skills are right now that you've liked or ones that you've liked in the past, you can really just try to lump this together as much as you can. And whenever you're going to look through job ads, um, you can actually look through sites like LinkedIn and narrow down by skill set. So for instance, if you go to your LinkedIn page and you say that you're good at statistical analysis, you can go down in the page and identify yourself as such, and then you can actually get matched to jobs that match your profile specifically. And you can do the same thing with other sites like Indeed and kind of in information sites like those. So examples um, here, I know this is a pretty data and information field chart, but if you'll notice some sample skills that I took into my current job, like I was talking about before, include project management and statistical analysis, but some of that that might appeal to other people more, um, especially T&D folks, would be process improvement. Um, maybe not as much financial planning and analysis. My mom was an accountant, so that's kind of where I got that from. But whenever you're going back through the PowerPoint, um, you can look at examples of how I did all this in my job right now, and then how I kind of plan to use it in the future. And so one of the things that I plan to do in the future would be working with the Navy. I hope to commission as an officer probably within about a year or so. It's been a thing on the map that I've wanted to do. Uh, my job right now is certainly very much endurable in a lot of different ways, but the Navy and the military in general has been on the map in terms of what I've wanted to do. And I just had to wait a while. Um, there's nothing wrong with taking a civilian job between then and the military or whatever it is that you decide to do. It's all about what your goals and kind of expectations are. So then the second step of kind of transitioning out would be thinking about what your vision for the future looks like. This is kind of getting into the big picture sort of part of your job search. And you can use this in really any setting as well. You can use it if you want to be a faculty member or an administrator or whatever it is. But once you have your vision really specific as to, for instance, where you want to live, what you want your boss to be like, what you want your job to emphasize, you start to get really specific. And sometimes I know it's easy to feel afraid of getting specific, but actually the more specific you could get, the better. Because if I hadn't been specific with where I wanted to live, what kind of job I wanted to have, who I wanted to be working with, I never would have wound up in this particular job, nor would I have found other jobs that really match the skills that I had. So really getting to, into the specifics, um, if you think of, for instance, the SMART goal acronym, that first kind of letter there is the S, and it stands for specific. So creating a vision board is a lot like creating uh, SMART goals. You're trying to figure out exactly what you want your life to look like, and it doesn't really have to be the five-year plan or 10-year plan that people tell you about, but it's really just what is that next step for you in your career journey. So steps for making a vision board, I'll show you some examples on the next two pages, and we'll go into them into a whole lot of detail, but 
Um, like I said, make sure that you list your priorities and values. And I really want to emphasize that it's your priorities and values. A lot of us get pressured by our families or friends or you know, maybe people in the academy too at times um, to go certain routes. But the most important thing to remember is that regardless of what other people want for you, at the end of the day, you're the one doing the job. You're the one who's the one dealing with the different problems as well as rewards and challenges that come with that specific job. And of course, you know, if you're weighing, for instance, um, family, like if you have maybe a spouse and kids, or maybe if you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, or, you know, just something like that, if you do have other people whose opinions may be, you know, kind of important to weigh, um, certainly do take those into account. But I think that any healthy relationship, you know, you try to negotiate through the best you can, and people try to figure out what makes them as a collective kind of happy and um, sort of efficient and thriving at work. So once you kind of find out that information, the priorities and values, um, this is a lot like art class in a way, but I think a little bit more fun. Um, some colleges and universities are actually doing this right now. There was my undergrad university, uh, Wake Forest, which uh, had one person who was doing this for a while. I think she's gone to a different university now, but you can actually create kind of a collage um, using everything that you know and you know just make sure that it looks kind of cohesive in the end. Once you have all those pictures, like I said, you put them together, and they make you kind of realize what your plan is in reality. You can use Photoshop, maybe, um, you kind of putting yourself onto, for instance, a public speaker's you know, body or something kind of silly like that. But it just gives you that next step of actually making it a possibility. You can see it. You can visualize it and reach out to it if you want. And then also putting the vision board somewhere where you can find it um, pretty easily. Like maybe I put mine on my computer screen with the background. Um, you may want to put it on a refrigerator or maybe a bathroom mirror, somewhere where you go all the time. I know that some people, even entrepreneurs specifically, actually will take theirs to their bedroom uh, kind of roof area, which is pretty cool. They wake up every morning and they see it. But make sure that you see it because it's hard to achieve anything if you don't really have a clear map as to where you're going, and if you see that map all the time, it's a lot easier to keep going. So one example, I won't go through the other one for time's sake, but the one that I have right here, I was trying to decide between going to Colorado and to Texas, and this was my Texas vision board if I'd gone there. Um, you can obviously see there's a lot of Western stuff, which is very much me. I'm the kind of person who grew up on a little house in the prairie. But there are also things like the government kind of symbols that you see here. I was planning on working in government there, too. Um, you'll notice downtown Austin with the Pride Parade, obviously living in a city that values diversity and inclusion is important. And then also being a math geek, um, maybe a bit of a, an outdoor person, too. Those are all important things, so I just stuck them all on a board. And I'll move forward from that one. So transitioning out part three, um, making sure that you track and manage your job applications. Um, I won't go into this in a whole lot of detail just because I think the visual on the next page will explain a lot. But making sure that you keep logs of where you're applying and where you're at in the process is really important. Sometimes you'll notice that certain companies like Lockheed Martin and some other ones will actually use what are called process maps. I use these at work as well when guiding people through promotional processes with police and fire personnel. And it's just really helpful to see how your process is supposed to work, where you are, kind of maybe in comparison to other departments or other organizations. That way you can figure out when you need to interview or when you need to complete certain things and by what deadline. It's just easy in terms of tracking and being organized and companies really value folks who can keep track of a lot of information like that in a very efficient, kind of clear way. Um, other things that you might want to do, like I said, there's a spreadsheet that's coming up. Uh, I won't go into that in a whole lot of detail. If you have questions, let me know. But you know, just making sure that you, for instance, use different colors to implicate or you know indicate different application statuses. Um, you can use a variety of things, like maybe sticky notes if you want to do something that's more paper-based. That's fine. But making sure that you have a clear system that helps you stay on uh, on top of everything will help you stay a little bit less stressed during the process. And like I said, here's an example of one of those spreadsheets, and I can send that kind of larger one to you. But then finally, the fourth one is negotiating benefits and compensation. And this is a pretty large area of the literature, so if you have more specific questions later on, I can get into those. But I actually did this area of the research for my dissertation. I looked at women in STEM, or uh, science, technology, engineering, and math occupations who 
all were trying to negotiate their salaries and their benefits. Um, specifically, they had done so or tried to in their last kind of job application process. But the key thing here, I think especially for people who are for maybe the first time um, getting out in the workplace is to really research what your job is worth. Sometimes you may not have a title, for instance, in the Bureau of Labor Statistics website that exactly matches what you do, but try to get something that's really close. That way you clearly have a very solid argument as to why you need something more. For instance, if you think that you should be paid more, once you make that argument in your case, you'd want to have something like BLS to back that up because it's a very credible website. I would not from an HR standpoint, use sites like Glassdoor because in the HR community, at least in most industry areas, Glassdoor tends to have either overinflated or underinflated salaries. So just be careful, make sure that your sources are more along the lines of government. And I don't say that because I'm a government person, but it's just these things are a lot more regulated, I would say, in comparison to others. And then there are also some other considerations like asking HR in your workplace to help you understand medical care, thinking about which states you want to move to or maybe which countries if you're leaving. And then there are all you know, these other kind of tips and tricks too. Like I said, it's a big area of the literature, but thinking about overall what are you getting from your job, maybe thinking about whether your salary is high enough if you maybe get really low health care costs or you get a pension or retirement plan. Just thinking of everything more holistically and going just beyond salary negotiation, but thinking of really what are you negotiating in terms of your life? What is your life going to look like with that job. And then other little tricks like thinking about psychological areas, like um, engaging in anchoring, which is trying to psychologically prime the person on the other end of the table to give you more money. Um, justifying why you need that money. So kind of again, looking back as to what your argument looks like, making sure you're informed and you're aware that way people think that you're credible. And then also trying to not go overboard with anything you learn in the neg uh, negotiation class, just because some of the research suggests that students, especially ones getting out of business school, who have taken all these classes in negotiation, and sometimes even law students, um, tend to kind of overplay um, in the dynamic. They tend to sometimes, not all of them, of course, but some of them, do go a little bit over the top and really push people too far as far as negotiation goes. And then here's an example, and this is from a product called Workday. Um, this is just a technology package that allows people to track their benefits and compensation. Again, I won't go into this in too much detail because I want to make sure we get to the other presenters. But you'll see here that there's a base salary here. It doesn't say specifically base salary, but just it's called salary plan in this program. It's base pay. Um, you'll notice that this is kind of a circle emphasizing the overall structure. Um, this person here is getting 85000 in terms of their base pay. But in terms of their benefits, uh, this is a government employee. So you'll notice that they get a certain health care plan, which is, I won't go into the whole HR language of it because it's a little bit complicated, even for someone like me. But this is a pretty reasonable amount of health care in terms of, and this is per year, this is not per month. I know a lot of people's jaws might drop at, you know, 300 and something dollars in health care a month. But this is per year, and then the government in this case is matching that person's contribution by a pretty considerable amount almost $6,000. A person gets dental care as well and then also basic life insurance. That person does not have to pay for that life insurance at all and pays a very, very minimal amount in dental care. And then once more, um, this is just an example of if you plan on going into the military. I won't go into every one of these acronyms, but you'll notice that some people think that the military is paid quite low. Um, you'll just notice that the basic pay for someone who is an officer level, this would be if you're a P, uh, like a PhD and you're planning on going into the military and you haven't been in there before, um, you would be either a captain in something like the Army or maybe a lieutenant if you're going in the Navy. But this is just for my particular zip code. Um, you know, you could go in and type where your zip code's at. But your base pay is really not the whole picture. You get quite a lot of money for housing. You also get a lot for food and other items. And then this isn't even including things like if you get deployed or if you have um, flight pay or anything like that. You also get a tax break. Um, so, you know, your benefits and compensation may work out to be very different. Um, so don't just try to stick with the salary alone. Sometimes that can be very misleading. All right. And then, Jeff, I will turn it over to you.
Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here uh, with uh, Abby and Deneen today and with all of you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is how to successfully uh, live in the world of the university, the academy, and as a independent consultant. And uh, most of my career has been like that, and I've been very happy, and it's been a very successful adventure for me. Um, and so that's our goal for today, is to give you some ideas of how to pull that off and also some ideas of how to be a successful consultant. So my story uh, is that I spent the first nine, ten years of my academic career in student affairs, and then I got my PhD and I started teaching, and I'm a full professor at Eastern Washington University and have been for some time now. So uh, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, and, and a lot of what I'm going to say dovetails with what Abby was talking about because many, if not actually most, of the things that she mentioned I either have done or am doing even now. Uh, and the first place to start is with your vision. What do you want to be? What type of research do you want to do? Uh, and for me, I fairly quickly identified that I did not want to be at an R1. I wanted to be at a teaching uh, university where I would do some research and scholarship and service. Uh, and I wanted a place that would identify with my values. And that's what I was able to find at, at Eastern. And your vision is going to evolve and mature over time. And some of the techniques that Abby mentioned are a great way to help you do that. And also, I think I agree with her totally. Uh, it's good to post those and know where they are. So I've got, uh, I really have three offices. And in all three of them are different variations and versions of what I'm trying to do right now. The most important thing for someone who has an action research model that's out doing work out in the field, and uh, some of that is service work, some of it is very applied research, is you've got to make sure that your vision is congruent with your institution, your department, your college, that you're going to be supported. And it's my recommendation that you negotiate that and make that very, very clear up front which is, was the advice I got from a couple of my mentors, and it's what I did when I came to Eastern. Um, it was very, very clear that I was going to be doing what I called action research out in the field. Uh, there's a couple of sources at the end that will uh, elaborate more on that. And that uh, I, I asked the question, will this type of research uh, help me get tenure? And I got an answer of yes from uh, my department and from my dean. And, and, and that, that's just so important. I have seen too many people uh, want to do that, and it's not congruent. And what happens then is uh, sometimes they get upset and bitter which and complain and be miserable and make everybody else miserable, which is a bad choice. Or they go find a new institution, or they figure out how to revise their vision and goals, and that's that's acceptable too. Uh, it's just very, very important that you know who you are and what you want to do with your life. I think that's good advice no matter what you're doing. Um, move on to the next slide. Uh, so one thing you have to understand is that systems exist for reasons. Um, and you've got to play the game based upon the rules, even when you don't like them. But I'm um, a big Star Trek, Trek fan. Uh, the Kobayashi Maru uh, is a good, uh, a good concept for me. And that is sometimes you rewrite the rules. And when I went up for tenure and promotion to associate professor, uh, my department chair was very, very supportive. And she says, you have got to build a case. And uh, I used uh, a couple of sources to build a case for the type of work that I was doing would, uh, was, was, was legitimate. And one of them, and this, this is way out of the box for me, was I wrote a computer program uh, as a consultant based upon research I did as a consultant for our uh, um, there was about four entities, the community colleges, Greater Spokane, the, the chamber, uh, uh, 
some workplace things, uh, labor and industry, where they wanted to be able to research the types of goals that uh, uh, employers wanted and also connect that with people. Well, um, I learned, um, I became a Microsoft Access programmer, and we submitted it as a uh, creative works in my promotion and tenure thing, and it uh, set right in there with a refereed article and a book that I had written. So, um, uh, and and so that was kind of rewriting the rules on that because no one had ever done that before. So for me, if you're going to go this type of route, this uh, the concept of self determination, taking leadership and control of your own life is very very important. Uh, the other thing that I think that you have to start thinking about is, you know, you really do have to understand the rules. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Uh, is uh, And so what are they? They're, well, they're state laws. For me, they're state laws, the State Ethics Board, University Policies and Procedures, Labor Management, and we're a union shop, and there's also a cultural perspective. Uh, and so... For me, what has worked is I have a very clear division between myself as a faculty member and myself as a consultant, and when I, I and I don't cross lines on on certain things. Uh, I gave one example there, but uh, again, it's about being very upfront. Uh, I don't uh, walk around trying to uh, hide the fact that I'm a consultant. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, two of the three of three of the four presidents that we've had at the institution have hired me to help them with some of their strategic planning and and uh, change management uh, so uh, it's just it's just who I am uh, and um, you know I, I have a business model that I follow um, you can go on with the next slide uh, uh, and I also do uh, I co-brand everything and so this is just an example of what uh, I would do uh, with a private, uh, if I was doing some work outside of the institution. Uh, you know, I've got my Stafford & Associates LLC. Uh, the work is copyrighted. Uh, I usually put my university credentials in there. And we, of course, for this one, we have the NCA information. Um, and I... I it, it's hard to set the only thing that I find hard to separate is the intellectual property. Where did that idea come from? Did that idea come at four o'clock in the morning when I was working on a, a project for uh, a business, or did it come while I was uh, uh, teaching class and I had an idea for something I wanted to do as a class exercise? I can't separate that, but um, I just uh, you know the body of work, the intellectual property is me. How I use it uh, depends upon it, whether or not I've got a client, or it's part of my service uh, work, or if it's part of my university work. Uh, we, so that's that. I think that's very very important. The next thing that I think is incredibly important is how do you decide what you're going to do, because. Um, I get asked to do a ton of things, and uh, very, very early on, one of my mentors said, don't be seduced by being a consultant, because it's really cool. Uh, somebody's got a problem, they don't know what to do. You ride in on a big white horse, tell them what to do, uh, hopefully with some good research and things like that, and then you ride away into the sunset before the hard part comes, which is actually doing it. Uh, and so you got to be careful there. Um, and so I use some very clear criteria. Is this going to build on research that's important to me when I'm putting on my consultant hat? Will it make a meaningful difference in my community? Uh, I used to have a business model that I tried to do about one-third of my work for corporate clients, one third for people in between, and one third pro bono. Uh, that's changed in the last few years, uh, primarily because uh, I don't have kids in college anymore, and I don't need that corporate work as much. And so now it's about 80% pro bono. 
In fact, I sometimes turn down paid corporate work to do something that makes my community a better community. Uh, how does it contribute to my what I'm doing for service? Is it going to make me a better faculty member? Am I going to learn something? Does it contribute to my teaching? Those are those are really really important things for you to decide on your own. Um, Another thing that's really important to me is how do I involve students or former students? Um, and you know, I have my own little ethical guidelines that help me do that. Uh, uh, I, I know of consultants who uh, kind of use their current students uh, and don't pay them anything, but they're making money. I, I would never do that. Um, and finally, I'm always trying to have fun. And for the most part, I almost always do have fun on these projects, and I learn a lot. Uh, so I think that's real critical for us. Um, and and but again, that's your personal decisions that you have to make. Uh, and so uh, you know, make sure that you're thinking that through really, really well. Um, we can move to the next one. Um, I drew a little Venn diagram to. To, to illustrate this, very, very early in my career, a couple of uh, my mentors who uh, I admired a lot said, uh, don't ever do anything that's only in one of the areas of teaching, service, or research. Uh, so I, I try and uh, always hit two. Uh, areas so where so maybe I'm doing something service wise that uh, is important and helping my teaching for example I teach a graduate uh, communication audit class and we take a team in we pick a nonprofit and we help them with their project I'm actually changing that now based because of the uh, the New edited book out of training development that JD and Dennis put together that are also in the source in the sources and several of us have uh, uh, chapters in there. Uh, I'm changing it to an organizational interventions, which could mean research, which could mean helping them with strategic planning, which could be helping them with a fundraising project. A um, couple of examples: uh, our communication audit class did a huge audit. Uh, for United Way a number of years ago. Um, and this was 20 some years ago. The uh, director of uh, their, their executive director said he had hired a consultant firm to do that in uh, I think it was San Diego or San Francisco and it was a $40,000 project and we were able to pull it off for a couple hundred dollars in photocopy cost and pizza. Uh, and so that was a really good thing. We helped our community, and that was my service and teaching went together. And it was it was teaching them how to do research. Um, so always think about operating in more than one of the, your categories if you're a university professor. Um, oh, uh, Craig had posted a question uh, way way earlier. Said there's some people here that are. Uh, undergraduates or maybe working on their master's degree um, and want to be a consultant I get that question all the time and what I would say to the to you and what I always say to them is first develop your skill set so you have something of value to offer the rest will follow the rest will follow uh, another thing I would suggest to you and I already talked about this a little bit is come up with a business model what is your business model going to be? Uh, uh, so that's the next slide, uh, Craig. Um, you know, you know, and so I've got corporate clients, uh, not as many anymore. Uh, most of my corporate client work has been uh, research for them, some training, more training in the beginning, uh, and uh, organizational development, and mostly lately working with senior leaders and. Uh, boards of directors on strategic planning and uh, process improvement. So know, know what you're going to do and also know that there's this group in the middle. Um, associations, school districts, uh, universities. I just finished two projects with universities, one in uh, Nevada and one in Oregon, 
where uh, we I help them. Uh, they're working with their president and deans and senior leadership, help them to set their goals, set their vision, really develop their strategic plan. Um, and those types of peop groups, I, I work with their budget. Usually it's half to two-thirds of my corporate rate. Um, but as I said earlier, right now I'm just really focusing on trying to do uh, what I would consider good stuff and fun stuff uh, for uh, organizations in need in my community, helping them improve. Um, one example of that, uh, we had a, uh, there were two boards of directors who frankly didn't get along. And uh, uh, they needed to raise $19 million to complete a project. And so I came in, worked with them till I got them at least uh, able to stay in the same room with each other without throwing things. And they and then developed the plan for raising the $19 million. Uh, I feel very, very good when I uh, drive by that museum and know that I had uh, a hand in it. Uh, moving onward, um, uh, you know, you have to build a case. If your university doesn't understand how the action research model works, you've got to build a case. And I found uh, uh, a couple of sources, I mentioned them here, Boyer, Kilman, McKinsey, and they're listed at the end, really helped me to do that. So in my promotion and tenure materials and then my promotion to full professor, uh, I had to address that. And my, uh, in my, uh, on my way to full professor, uh, I wasn't thinking about doing it. And my dean came to me and said, are you going up for full, full this year? And I said, well, no, I don't have uh, the, the four refereed articles. I've just got this. And he said, that's OK, because we want you to be the test case for showing that, the, this, that good work can be done and it doesn't have to end up in a referee journal only. Now, there are some institutions I know would never accept that. But uh, that's the direction our leadership was wanting to go. So using Boyer and his four levels of scholarship, I uh, submitted some work. And some work we sent out to others to vet. And, uh, we sent, I had written numerous uh, white papers, analysis papers uh, in the developing of our strategic plan and our uh, uh, comprehensive uh, marketing uh, recruitment plan. And we sent those to three different people. Two of them were university professors, and one was the vice president of one of the larger uh, uh, university uh, recruitment consulting firms. And they all analyzed it, asking questions that are on the next slide. Uh, and uh, so go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, there we go. And this, these, were, these were the criteria we use. Uh, does the work ask or answer an interesting question? Is there a theoretical or conceptual basis? What was the methodology or process. Is there a product and how has that product been vetted in some way? Product uh, works are vetted by uh, editorial boards to say, yes, we're going to publish this. But they can be vetted in other ways. So finally, uh, you got to learn the language as a consultant when you're sitting at the table with people in business and industry. That's absolutely crucial. Uh, you uh, take advantage of opportunities and really try and control your own destiny. It's uh, uh, been a great journey for me, and I'm going to wrap it up now so that we can move on to Deneen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Abby. And I'm Deneen, and I just like to um, just kind of hit a lot of the same points that Jeff and Abby made. And I'm just going to do it from a different perspective. I'm not 
Um, I do go out and I do services. However, I'm not a paid consultant. Right now, a lot of what I do is volunteering so that I can network. And what I found just in going to school as an undergraduate and a graduate is that what my niche really was and what I like to do. And I found that that was quilting. So I found the way to allow quilting and what it actually symbolized to fit in with theoretical and practical approaches of communication studies. So I found that different things that are associated with our lives, different things that start off with the fiber of our lives and how those fibers become threads and fabrics and that those fabrics all have purposes and what we make them into, whether we're making them into clothing, whether it's um, uh, for instance, quilts or blankets or comforters, different uses, uh, practical uses as far as keeping us warm, covering the bed, or aesthetic as far as showing them. And I like to teach from them. And this particular quilt that you see in front of you is based on semiotics and symbolic interactionism. And not that the images are very large, but I could kind of walk you through them. So the top portion would basically be what your emotions and things are. And the reason why I use this quilt is to teach basically about the theories and things. It's also for interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. So if I go back to what Abby and Jeff were discussing as far as becoming a consultant and looking outside of academia for different jobs and looking into who you are, we have to understand who we are and why we operate in different ways. And I did that again through the imagery from semiotics and symbolic interactionism. So I talk about the emotions and behavior and I use different um, as far as environmental changes, as far as the rain, as far as the sun, as far as clouds, daytime versus nighttime. And then if you look just below to your left, you'll see a, a panel, if you'd say, that has more imagery in it. And it looks a little confusing. And that kind of represents what a conflict is, would be or as we get to understand and try to solve different images, the, uh, different um circumstances, it may seem to be confusing. So as we're transitioning from one thing to another, we have to understand where we're at and where it is we're trying to go. So with the quilt in that particular panel, there are arrows crossing each other, there's a spider web, there's um, waves, there's someone over talking, there. There's a imagery of a pinwheel or of an hourglass. And I talk about um, in the audience as far as a seminar web, excuse me, seminar or workshop, what those images actually mean. So we talk about a spider web that can mean you're tied up or your cord into something or railroad tracks where you're railroaded into something or baggage where you're carrying baggage or people knocking heads and then we start talking about coping mechanisms so as we're transitioning and as we're trying to move to other steps we have to understand not just what we are and what we see but the way someone else sees the same thing that we see and it could be different so if we move to the middle panel if you'd say that talks more of um the steps that you're going to take in order to resolve image, in order to resolve conflicts. And in order to resolve the conflicts, the conflicts, the steps that you take will vary. But the steps that I identify here is your heart, your brain, uh, you're taking your temperature, seeing things, hearing things, smelling, and then at or using your nose, which actually works as a filter, and you could breathe in and breathe out. And then the last one, which you can barely see, is a mouth. And the tongue is more or less shaped like the heart, just kind of indicating that the process is not linear. It could be cyclical. It's, you know, it goes around. And inside the plants or the flowers, as we're starting to blossom and understand where we're going in, what directions we're going in with relationship to who we are, how we deal with other people, jobs and things that we're seeking, there are mi mirrors that are 
actually embroidered into each one of those flowers where we actually have to truly start reflecting on who we are, what it is that we want, why we want those particular things. And then last is where we kind of bring everything home after we've done certain analysis and different things of that nature. And we really have taken the time to assess where we've come from, the steps that we've taken, and actually where we want to go. At the bottom, the very bottom, those are pockets. Um, and in those pockets, it would be a process that you would go through in order to build that dialogue with respect to conflict resolution or it's building interpersonal, intrapersonal or group skills, where you would actually go through a sensory or different ways of learning where we're going to write down what the particular conflict is, what the particular steps are to resolve it, and what it should look like once we get to the conflict resolution or management stage. And once we go through re writing it, then we go through reading it, and then we'll start that dialogue. So we can move on to the um, next slide, please. So part of it and understand that semiotics is understanding the differences and how we see things and how others see things. So as we going in and you're looking for a particular job, we have to understand what the manager, what the directors of those jobs are looking for. Sometimes what we see and how we see it may be totally different than what that director or manager or whoever's interviewing us may see. So I talk about the symbolisms, the words, and the interpretations. So I like to tell a story about, you know, when I was growing up, we had a German Shepherd. I loved the dog. The dog was so much of a protector. Um, later on, my daughter was bitten and attacked by a dog. And my image of the dog and how cute it actually changed based based on experience. So diff, just as Abby and Jeff were talking about visions and how visions change, we have to understand different companies and businesses, they evolve and they'll, they'll grow just as our visions and things are going to change and evolve as well. So just the way we see things and we understand them to be what they are based on sem semiotics or symbolic interactionism, we have to understand that these are theories that are in place, but we also have to understand how they apply as far as communication studies students um, and undergraduate and undergraduate as well as practitioners and, and the like. We can progress to the next slide, please. So here are some of the theories that we I've talked about, um, semiotics. Um, and symbolic interactionism, how we see the different signs and they mean different things to different people, as well as expectancy violation, how when you go in and you're looking for something, if we're not preparing ourselves correctly, we may feel that socially or our expectations or different things are are a challenge and it may make us uncomfortable. And there's also the social penetration theory. How much are you truly revealing about yourself and about others um, and what your expectations are of that job and how much have they actually revealed to you so that you can go in fairly and actually achieve what you want? And then we have social judgment theory, as well as the elaboration likelihood model and cognitive dissonance. So in all, we have to understand who we are, what it is that we're going for, how it all applies to what we're doing and where we're going. And sometimes it means that we have to create or recreate ourselves. Uh, we can progress to the next slide, please. So all things that we need to consider when we're looking for different jobs and different opportunities or we're planning on switching from one to the other, we have to know and understand what our learning styles versus the person that we're looking for, the corporations, what they're expecting. So to relate to people, we want to make sure that we're relating in a way that they can understand us and we can understand them. So we have to have some type of understanding, whether it's visual, whether it's interactive, haptic, oral, kinesthetic, 
or print oriented olfactory. And then we have to take into consideration some of the personality types. Now, a lot of times we're not gonna know all of these things all at once, but there's certainly indicators as far as different environments and different settings that we're in that we can somewhat manage or begin to understand these different things. And then we have to understand if there's a particular conflict, if you're searching for understanding how to search for um, just what the salaries are, particular areas that you want to live in and what those requirements are as far as retirement and different things of that nature. Um, you might have a, it with your interest. It could be structural, your value system, or it could be as far as your relationship with the different people there. Understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what is it going to actually do for you and at what level? And can you be satisfied if any one of those things are not in order? Um, and how can you cope and how can you actually reverse some of these things so that they do fit who you are? And that goes into the conflict and communication styles. Are you going to be avoiding? Are you going to be accommodating, compromising, competing? Or are you going to try to ultimately build a an environment where you can begin to collaborate. And we start to understand again, what's in it for me, but not just for me or the win, what they call it or what, how it's said, not just understanding what's in it for you, but also what's in it for other people as well. What can you benefit from? But we also wanna know how we can assist others and benefit and in having the most of what they're doing. So those motivations could be from an intrinsic standpoint or an extrinsic standpoint where it could be extrinsic, as Jeff said, when he was working and he was working more with the corporations because he had children in school. So he needed more of the finances. And now he's moving more to intrinsic where he's doing things because he likes to do them and that's what he can do in life. So he's wondering, you know, working more towards building community and building others. And in that since it makes him more happy. And then we look at Bloom's tech, taxonomy as far as what our learning objectives are and where we want to go from there. Um, my apologies. I know I talked really fast. I hope you understood what I said. Can we uh, move on to the next slide, please? So with the vision, I just want to say in closing that you create your own vision. I learned how uh, to quilt based on different things that were inside of me. And then going through school, I learned how to apply quilting to communication studies and how to network and how to go out and how to volunteer in different things. And now I'm taking courses so that I can learn how to successfully be a consultant. So I'm building my strategic plan and my business plan and different things of that nature. Um, my vision has changed multiple multiple times as far as how I'm going to do a particular business. And I just need to make it clear that for, as I just graduated recently, and I'm an older student, that as an undergraduate and at graduate student, a lot of this didn't make too much sense, but I knew what my vision always was, and it did evolve and it did mature over time time. And it's okay to have multiple visions as to what type of job or what things are interesting to you and what things you like. It's just that you, in closing, keep your focus and just believe and maintain a sense of security and that whatever you're going to do, you will be successful in. Thank you. Great job, Deneen and Abby. Thank you. You as well, Jeff and Deneen. All right, this is Dee again, and I want to start off by thanking Abby, Jeff, and Denise for sharing their experience with us. I want to encourage you um, to provide our three presenters with your feedback on this program today. There is a link on the slide that's up there right now for a survey for you to complete to provide that feedback for them. And go ahead and switch it to the next slide. Okay, we will be providing additional webinars that will be free to you in spring of 2019. 
The best way to stay connected with us is on the next slide there. <laughs> Um, is to subscribe to our mailing list. We do offer newsletters, and um, we also have a Facebook page that's for our group. And you can join the NCA Training and Development Division. That's where we have all met each other. We do have a, a um, conference coming up here on November 8th through the 11th in Salt Lake City. And I do want to encourage you to take an opportunity and join the division because NCA looks at our division membership for a measurement of our division recognition, the voice that we receive as a division, and the slots that we get at our nat national conference. Um, so hopefully we will see you November 8th through 11th. We do have some great sessions lined up. And we do have a meet and greet as well that you'll read about in our upcoming newsletter. So please, if you're not already on our mailing list, please join it. And um, if not, if you aren't going to be at the conference, I do encourage you to join us for um, upcoming events that we'll offer as an additional webinars. So that's all that I have. We do have a couple more minutes if you want to ask questions. So it looks like uh, Noah would like to ask a question. Yeah, hello. So as I mentioned before, most of the people came in today. I work currently as a graduate assistant uh, in student affairs with retention management and planning at my university. And I'm trying to find ways to bridge the gap between student affairs and being a communication scholar. What realms should I start directing myself toward professionally, just as far as needing some basic guidance to apply my academic endeavors and my professional endeavors and tying that into a marketable uh, trait when I'm wanting to pursue, like initially I wanted to uh, become like a teaching assistant. Um, <clears throat> and that that is my ultimate goal, but also I enjoy the research and I enjoy doing uh, Honestly, I enjoy writing papers, as twisted as that sounds. But I want to uh, try to find a way to tie student affairs into communication studies. Uh, what what basic advice can you guys give me as far as how I should apply my experience right now into directing myself into the professional realm post-graduation? Well, if anybody else doesn't want to immediately speak to this, um, I've actually done research that is at the intersection of what Noah is talking about. Um, the first year and a half that I was in the doctoral program at Michigan State University, my research team was working on looking at communication patterns in teams of, I believe it was their title was resident assistant at the time, so the students who kind of monitor dorm affairs and everything, engage in kind of first aid if people need it. Um, we were able to look at the healthy versus unhealthy conflict communication behaviors of people in those groups, their other leadership traits, and kind of just see overall how healthy was their training, how healthy was their communication. So you can actually apply what Noah's, um, a lot of what Noah's talking about to understand situations like those. And in terms of making your research practical, what we were able to do is I had a team of undergrads and then my professors, um, we all were kind of doing this together, but we actually trained the undergrads to kind of, um, I guess you could say, unpack some of the feedback that was given from um, the surveys that those resident assistants took on what to do about training in the future, what was going well, what wasn't. And in the end, we ended up creating a PowerPoint for the, I think it was assistant director of residence life at the time, um, kind of showing him what the statistics were in terms of what people were telling him. And he was actually able to use that and go back and change and improve the training, so everything kind of came full circle. Excuse me, full circle. Um, so I think that kind of talks about that in terms of what Noah is looking at, in terms of bridging the gaps between maybe research and writing papers and kind of making everything more applied. Uh, yeah, I, w I would chime in and say, uh, yeah, I think that's right on target. Uh, I started my career uh, in universities as an undergraduate student when I was 
a, a student staff member in the residence halls at K-State, and by the time I left K-State, I was assistant director of housing. Um, especially now, where there's so much emphasis on metrics and assessment, uh, there's, there's just tons of opportunity to do good research. And some of the metrics and assessment are good, and some of them are less so. Um, so I would look at what are the significant issues that are facing your institution mm -hmm. and uh, figure out ways to work with uh, vice presidents or directors of housing or uh, uh, people who are in charge of admissions and recruitment to analyze those and then uh, try presenting them at uh, ACUHO, which is the Housing Association, or NASPA, or ACPA. Uh, my actually uh, uh, first publication ever was uh, in um, an ACUHO journal where we were analyzing a study skills program that a um, uh, guy over in the counseling center and I developed where we trained uh, resident assistants to teach study skills on their floors. And we did a pre and post questionnaire and uh, found some difference in the uh, students, but found almost a whole grade point difference uh, improvement in the student staff who were delivering the program. So uh, look, look for the problems and issues. Uh, living learning communities, uh, first year experience uh, classes, uh, orientation programs, and those are all things that you could be doing research in that would be very valuable for your institution, and you would learn something while you're doing them. That's my thoughts. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? If not, I believe we're at the top of the hour. And I don't want to cut it short and boot everyone out, but I actually need my Skype for a client call, actually, so um, <laughs> in, in, in 10 minutes. So uh, if, well, we can probably get one more question in if anybody has something that's super pressing. What, one last thought I'd throw in while people are thinking about the question is uh, it's hard work, uh, whether you're uh, being a full-time consultant and working with clients or trying to do have your feet in both worlds, uh, expect to work harder than many of your peers. <laughs> so true. Go for it, Noah. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of lay out a situation that I'm dealing with that is a political situation, it's a social situation, but also it's an opportunity to capitalize on as far as, an, like from an academic standpoint. Right now we have a lot of racial tension on my campus. Um, and this is something that I'm interested in trying to dip my toes into to see if I can kind of make an impact here. And I don't, I don't throw the, around the term uh, impact very loosely. Um, we have a very high sense of racial tension on Texas State University campus. Um, and that boils down to we have a lot of like white supremacy uh, pamphlets being distributed on campus. But from a communicative standpoint, what direction would you recommend my initial research take to not only rectify the situation, but to create that sense of cohesion among these students on campus. Any, that's a five billion dollar question. Uh, exactly, take, and that's take why it's hours. so strange. Uh, I would suggest you reach out to uh, 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 any any of us offline. Uh, where we have a chance to really talk more. Okay. Thank and you very uh, much for you guys' input on that. D, I, I know it's yes. sensitive. <laughs> D, I see your question there. They're in my slides. Uh, so the the last slide of my slides is the uh, where are the sources I spoke to. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all's time. No problem, no. And I think that's one of the benefits of these webinars is you can network and meet up with people. So uh, do reach out to folks. And I think the question you asked actually uh, is not just something that you're dealing with on your campus. So whatever you find there, 
uh, should have a broader audience. And I look forward to hearing what you do find. So with that said, I think uh, we are at the time limit. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining. This was an excellent webinar. We will post it to our YouTube channel for NCA, send it through our Facebook channel, and also through our mailing list. So please join it if you haven't already done so. Thanks again, uh, Abby, Deneen, Jeff. This was awesome. Uh, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Yep, it was great fun. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye.